straight in and pose the question to each of you, because this, I think, is where the, the discussion has gone, and each of you have alluded to it in some way. OK, having identified the problem, or, or at least a component part of it, what do you do about it beyond identifying it? Identification is, of course, fantastic. What you've all said, yes, we need to identify it and do that. But having identified, say, that there is a problem particularly of Islamist anti-Semitism uh, in France and the continent and here, what's the next step? What is the process that either government or society should do to actually tackle that? Um, <laughs> Simone's going to come and address the French context in a moment, but I'm going to throw that to Douglas as well, um, because it's a natural yeah. point. You've been saying this for some time. Yeah, I mean, I, look, there are two, there are two parts of it. I mean, there's the government bit of it, what can be done in legislation and so on. I think actually the current government's done a lot of very good things in that uh, regard. Um, there's obviously extra legislation and tweaking of legislation that can happen, but I mean, I sort of think that bit's in hand. The, bit, the, bit, the truth is, that the thing, as I sort of alluded to earlier, and it's not just a Jewish community issue here, but it's an everyone issue. The truth is, the great disappointment of the last 14 years has been that civil society has failed, that um, we can't do the things to the Islamists that we would do, as I referred to, to the neo-Nazis. You know, we just, we just not... It seems we're not set up for it, or people don't have the guts and the balls for it. They just... You know, they fear being called a name more than anything. And, um, you know, the thing I've always said is, we'll win when an Islamist who is not breaking the law but is saying horrible and hateful things is treated in the same way that Nick Griffin is treated. That's when we'll win. You know, because we all recognize he has a right to freedom of speech and so on and so forth, and if he's not breaking the law and it's a legal party and so on. But, you know, we don't invite him to loads of places. The Quakers don't host Nick Griffin, you know, to, to have Q&A sessions. You know, the Methodist Church doesn't celebrate the political thought of Nick Griffin. You know, the, the Anglican Church doesn't have hymn sheets that promote things that Nick Griffin thinks. Of course not. We know what to do with those types of fascists. But societally, we've totally failed to understand, to even recognize, and then to deal with this type of fascism. Uh, it, it's, it's a magnificently terrible failure, and we're reaping the rewards. We have to wake up to this. Yes, well, I'm hoping you may have. We, uh, so far, we've been very consensual on the panel. I think when Brendan threw his grenade of uh, the Netanyahu uh, statement in, it may provoke something. I don't know, Douglas, uh, you, you may not be well, answering I, this. But... No, well, look, I... Everyone, Is it helpful? Has, everyone has disagreements with Netanyahu over various things. I'm just, I'm concerned, I have to say, in the, in the British narrative, I mean, I looked at the Metro newspaper, that awful junk-free paper you get on the tubes on a Monday morning, and, you know, two days after Copenhagen, what do they lead on their front page? Outrage as Netanyahu, you know, says that Jews... It's, the story is not about Benjamin Netanyahu, it really isn't. And, I mean, I, but, I, but I appreciate and, you know, and, and definitely see obviously sensing what Brendan and others have said. I just want to make a very quick point about the French thing, which is I have a lot of uh, friends in, in France and a lot of Jewish friends in France, and one of the things that struck me very much in recent years is this. The, the problem that, that, that French Jews have, to my mind, is that they are in the middle of a pincer movement, which fortunately in Britain we don't have. And what I mean is that on the one hand you have the Islamists, a very large uh, immigrant population of whom the, on whom the Islamists can draw, but the main reaction to that comes from uh, the Front National. And, and there you have this terrible problem that, that, that it is possible that historically the solution to the Islamist thing, the only one is coming from Marine Le Pen, and she may not be her father, but do you really want to put your future in the hands of somebody whose father is a Holocaust minimizer? No, of course not. So this is the problem. Now, in this country, I just think, you know, we're not to recognize the things that we don't have. We don't have that problem. And that is worth mentioning. You know, the farthest right, as it were, party there is UKIP really is not, an, you know, a Holocaust minimizing, Holocaust denying party. And I do think that as well as excoriating people when they get things wrong, it is very important to praise people when they get things right. But one very quick other point on that. There's a, a book that was coming out, at the, that came out at the same time as uh, uh, the atrocities last month by uh, Walbeck, Michel Walbeck, uh, called Submission. It's a, you, some of you have re read about it. There is a point in this book which I think is extremely important for what we must, after all, think of, which is how to widen this beyond the people in this room and to widen this into wider society. The most important thing in this novel is a moment where uh, the, the French professor, not to give away the whole plot, there's a French professor who everyone, uh, Muslim, uh, France is becoming a Muslim country in 2024, and, this, uh, and the Jews are all leaving, and uh, this professor, who is not, a, not, not Jewish, he's a sort of atheist Frenchman, uh, likes his pleasures, you know, 
sees, is speaking to a, a Jewish friend who says they're off to Israel. And there's a very, very important point in the novel where this man says he, he realizes he doesn't have an Israel. Now, this is a very, very important thing to tell people in general in this country. Uh, and it is far beyond Jews. I don't have an Israel. Uh, this is it. If you care about a decent, democratic, broadly pluralistic society in which you can live the life you want to live, this is the best deal and I don't have a get out option. Now other people need to know that. PhD student in sociology at London School of Economics, a hotbed of Islamist activism. And uh, my question is, have any of the panelists read, it's a somewhat controversial question, have any of the panelists read Paul Collier's book, Exodus, on immigration? And given Paul Collier's conclusions about when certain communities reach a critical mass, that they become impermeable to the, the general values of civil society, of, the, of the, the majoritarian values of that society, do they believe, and this is a controversial bit, that some restrictions on immigration and perhaps even on asylum seeking uh, should be imposed so as to give the country some breathing room and, uh, and give the country, uh, and this applies to France especially, uh, uh, some opportunity uh, to better integrate and better assimilate its, its new citizens. Thank you. Right, a ton of questions there. Um, Douglas, I promise you to start. You can start. Um, the answer to the last gentleman's question is yes. I mean, I've always taken a lot of heat for this, but my own belief is you cannot integrate people when you have immigration at this speed. The Huguenots are always cited. 50,000 Huguenots came after 1683. That was about six weeks average immigration over the last decade and a half into this country. I think it's unsustainable. I I'm not afraid to say it, but it's a controversial point. A lot of other people think, you know, uh, uh, bring uh, a bunch of people from Syria to Acton and they become as London as anyone else. And, and it's just, that's not the case. These things, as Jews and others know, these take time. Um, it takes a lot of time and I don't think it's going to work, frankly, at the speed we're going at uh, for any of our countries. I want to say very quickly, um, uh, uh, look, these are deep waters, some of these questions. Um, so let me plunge straight in. <laughs> Um, look, I, I differ from others on this panel, and I'm sure in this room, in that, um, yeah, I think, I think there is a fundamental problem that Islam is unwilling to phase up to, and that it's come, it comes from the origins, it's there in the origins, it's not insuperable, it's not unsolvable, it's not impossible to be overcome, but it is there. And um, General Sisi, I mean, you know, I wish it hadn't been him who'd said it, but General Sisi was right, uh, and he was right to lecture the scholars of Al-Azhar about this. If you doubt this, consider just two of my favorite important Al-Azhar comments recently. One is that, uh, um, uh, one was a statement in December from Al-Azhar saying that ISIS, uh, yes, they are terrorists, but they are not to be deemed heretics. This is a very, very important point. This is not an ignorant point. Uh, and the second was the reaction to the burning of that brave young Jordanian pilot. Uh, a senior scholar of the Al-Azhar says, um, the Imam, uh, says uh, they had violated the laws, uh, Islamic prohibition on def defiling a body. And what must be the punishment for the people who did that? Crucifixion. <laughs> You've got to take your last where you can these days, ladies and gentlemen. I'm chopping off one hand. Um, yes. Now, uh, uh, look. Um, let, let, let's move on quickly to a couple of other quite deep waters, but let me do it briefly. The silent majority, no, no. We know that it's not, a, it's, 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 it's not a minority problem within Muslim communities in Britain we're talking about. Why do we know this? Because a dear friend of mine called Mehdi Hassan very kindly provided me and you with an article uh, 18 months ago saying, anti-Semitism among Muslim communities in the UK is endemic and rife and commonplace. He said it is, and all Muslim readers will know what I'm talking about, our dirty little secret. This cannot be reiterated often enough. That's Mehdi Hassan, who I don't think anyone would describe as, as a progressive. Um, but let me very quickly, on the, uh, finally, on this business about the free speech and Holocaust denial laws. I'm, there are reasons why France and Germany and countries on the continent have Holocaust denial laws, and it's important to know why. I'm against them because 
I believe in the tradition of Milton and Mill that bad ideas will be chased out in a free expression and free speech. Bad ideas will be chased out by good ideas. And that in a free and open discussion, there's no way that the Holocaust deniers will win. There's no way. The only chance they have to win is if we shut down the discussion and people get lazy and flabby and forget their facts and then the people who know most about it end up being the deniers. That long term is the problem and that's why I'm against them in long term. But, but, let me, but let me reiterate, there are reasons on the continent why they have them. But just very quickly, if I may, on this free speech issue, which it comes back to, I started on it and I want to finish on this for me. The free speech issue matters so much, and why, they, why people are literally gunning for it so much is the following reason. It is an accident of Scandinavian history that a cartoon and cartoons ended up being the front line on this. Pure accident. I care about this not because I'm a cartoonist, but because it could have been anything else. It could have been a piece, it could have been a book, a novel, a song, it could have been an idea. What they are trying to stop is the idea. This is a very well chosen target. They have chosen their targets well, and they've chosen them carefully, because people now do not want to talk about the idea. And some of the things I say, I know that they make people uncomfortable, but increasingly it's more than discomfort that people say. That is why the terrorists are doing so well. They can only win if they stop us being able to speak and express ourselves. And that is why the cartoon matters so much. As my friend who organized that meeting in Copenhagen said to me the other day, you know, it is about the cartoonists first and then the Jews. And people say, well, why, why don't you stop publishing cartoons if they offend people? Why don't you impose effectively a de facto Islamic blasphemy law? She said, it's because what are we meant to do about the Jews? Do the Jews have to stop being Jews? What's the next target after that? What's the thing that has to stop because it offends people? after that. That's why the line has to be drawn so clearly on this. Unadulterated freedom of speech, including saying that people, things that people find offensive, because it's the only way that the correct and good ideas have any chance of winning, and they have to win. From Jeffrey's question to Gabrielle's point, to Paul asking about religion, to Sandra, the leadership have failed us, and yes, the answer is that we need uh, 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 as well as challenging Islamism within Muslim communities, we need a reform discourse. And what's the answer? What's the alternative? Well, I would argue, let's not get stuck in the kind of what's a good Muslim, what's a bad Islam, what's good Islam debate. I don't care what somebody, how many times somebody prays at home and, and what they cover with their head with and how long their beard grows and how high their ankle trousers are up to their shins or whatever. I don't care about any of that as long as they don't try and impose that on anyone else. So that's why I'm an honorary associate of the National Secular Society. The solution to all of this is to reassert small L liberal, human rights, pluralistic, democratic values and grow a spine. I just wanted to detain you for 30 seconds longer, if I may, just to mention that, that uh, you know, famously, Anna Akhmatova was visited in, in Moscow in the worst days by Isaiah Berlin, and she had a conversation that was free about ideas, and she said to a friend afterwards, it was like meeting a visitor from the future. What you've just heard is the future. That is the answer. And there are very few people who are willing to say it, and I think that deserves an enormous amount of tribute. <laughs> <laughs>